Hello, and welcome to Insightful Conversations with your host, Three Principles Practitioner, Del A.D. Jones. Join her each week as she welcomes some of the world's leading Three Principles teachers and practitioners who share how this understanding has dramatically improved the quality of their lives and the lives of those they work with. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I'm so thrilled to have as my guest, Christine Heath. In addition to being one of the original students of Sydney Banks, Christine is a licensed marriage and family therapist in both Hawaii and Minnesota, as well as a nationally certified addictions counselor. As the co-founder of the Hawaii Counseling and Education Center, Christine has been helping people to understand the three principles for nearly 40 years. She's also a much sought after world renowned speaker on the principles. Thank you, Christine, and so happy to have you here today. Thank you for having me. What a what a thrill this is. Oh, thank you. So um, I am going to have you share um, how you first came across the principles. Um, I you I listened to you talk at the Manhattan Conference, and it was a very very funny story. So I'd love you to share that with my listeners today. Okay. Um, I was, I had been a therapist for about seven years and this was um, in the seventies. So at that time there was kind of um, some pretty interesting kinds of therapy. And I worked with uh, women who were um, sexually and physically abused, Mm -hmm. um, which at the time there was really nobody else doing that. So Mm -hmm. I was really kind of a pioneer in, in doing that. But in doing that, I got really burned out because kind of the way I thought you should do therapy is connecting with people's pain and suffering. Mm. So after doing that for, I mean, I had about uh, 60 clients a week. So I was pretty burned out and I was really, I was turning 30 and I just turned 30. And I really thought that if I found a man um, to marry me, I'd be much happier. So um, my friend, Joe Bailey went to this training and he came back and he said, this is really great new stuff. And oh, and by the way, I met my wife and and this woman who became his wife and and she's really sweet and I really like her, blah, blah, blah. So he uh, brought one of the speakers up a couple of months later and everybody in my clinic decided to go. And I didn't want to be the one person left out, although going to a male psychologist at the time wasn't really something I thought I could learn much from. But I was sitting there and I thought, well, you never know when you might meet a man and maybe going to psychology conferences instead of bars, I would be able to find someone that was uh, willing to marry me. <laughs> so so I um, signed up and I signed up for both days because the second day was optional, but I thought if I met a man the first day and I wasn't signed up, it would look too obvious if I signed up for the second day. So it was quite um, a scheming on my part. So I went to the training and I was kind of the person in the audience that you hate to have in our audience who's asking all the questions that are really um, argumentative and um, very negative. And the feeling I had was just very um, combative. And I remember that we broke for lunch and at the time, I, I had a, this clinic with about you know, 10 other therapists, and we were all sitting together having lunch together, and we were talking about how what we were doing was good, and that this really wasn't anything new, and um, what was the big deal, and we got up from the table, and it was kind of a, a weird kind of thing that happened is I got up, and I remember turning around, and everybody was kind of stuck in time, you know, like, where the main character in the TV show keeps walking and everybody else stops in time. Yes, yeah. And it that happened and I thought, oh, weird. And then I turned around and as I was walking out, Dr. Mills, who was the person that came up to do the seminar, was walking out at the same time. Now, by this time I knew he was single. So I was thinking <laughs> about dinner. And, and I thought, gee, you know, maybe I should like listen to him a little bit so that when I, talk to him, I don't sound like I'm an idiot. And I remember we were walking toward the room and he had the nicest feeling of any person I'd ever talked to. It was like kind of talking to Velvet, you know, when you yeah. stroke, yeah, it was just a really beautiful feeling. And so I went in the afternoon session and I thought, okay, I better pay attention here. So I'm, I'm listening 
And then the morning, I kind of thought everybody else in the room understood him because he would answer my questions, but I didn't understand him. It just like went over my head. Mm. And um, so the afternoon I started listening and I remember that now you have to understand the times were interesting, but he said to focus on positive. And I thought, oh, positive. I could do positive. <laughs> now, at the time, positive was kind of considered malpractice because you weren't really oh. concentrating on people's pathology. Mm -hmm. And then we had a break and there was a physician there. And at the time, I thought that physicians being smart enough to make it through medical school were like one step down from God. And so I went up to this doctor and I said to him, I said, well, what do you think about this? And he said, well, it makes pretty good common sense to me. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, if a doctor thinks this is good, maybe I should listen. So I went back in the afternoon, the last session, and Roger put this diagram thing on the board. And all of a sudden, I had this huge shift. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I've been doing everything backwards. Wow. I've been trying to fix things after people create that. No wonder I'm not happy and they're not happy. Yeah. So I started... I started laughing, really, I laughed for about three days, but it was, um, it was interesting because what I found what was what I was looking for was love. It just wasn't in the form that I thought it was. Yeah. Roger Ellis did not become my date, but um, <laughs> he, he definitely pointed me toward the true source of love, which was within me. Mm, that's so I, beautiful. I love that. And, and you were a really quick learner. I mean, you just, it, you got it. Yeah, I, I always say that life looked at me and said he, that they needed some teachers and looked at me and said, you're one and you need to change a lot. <laughs> so I kind of felt like I somebody grabbed me by the collar of my shirt and yanked me up a few levels of wow. awareness. And yeah, so I changed so much that people thought that I had joined the Moonies or that I was on drugs or that I'd met a man. That, <laughs> they've never really seen a person change that much yeah. without attributing it to something on the outside. Yeah. And I, at the time, I mean, I was a very well-known therapist in Minneapolis. I was really pioneering the work in family violence and people would call me up and say, Chris, we heard you flipped out. And I said, well, I said, I think I flipped up. And if <laughs> this is what flipping out is, you should try it because I've never been happier in my life. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of it. Like they couldn't really, say anything because I was obviously a healthier human being mm. like the results really spoke for themselves but yeah I, I I changed a lot in fact all of my clients I think three people dropped out wow. and everybody else stayed and what they said was that they could see that I was in a better place and whatever I was doing they wanted to do yeah so yeah. it was it was like the blind leading the blind because at that time there were no books there were no there were, I had one cassette tape, you know, those little cassette tapes that they used to have? Yes. And I would play that every day when I came home, a Sid Banks tape. Wow. And I listened to that sucker every day until I started talking in my groups. I'd start talking with an A, you know, Canadian A. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is too much. No, I'm listening. <laughs> well, at least you didn't have a sto Scottish brogue. <laughs> I didn't have a Scottish brogue, thank goodness. But, that would have um, been funny. So, yeah. um... I mean that that's is so that just speaks to it right there. I mean they your clients saw the change in you, so they trusted and they went along with you. So how did you transition from where you were in Minnesota to where you are now and the um, the um, beautiful, incredible place you have in Hawaii? So how did that come about? Well, um, actually, I was by that time, Joe and I set up our the first clinic um, based on the principles, and mm -hmm. um, I was the executive director. And in that position, I was a little too hard on people. I was very, I could come across very harsh and really hard on people. And I, to me, I, I didn't think I was because I was way harder on myself. But yeah. I, I did. And so Joe took me aside one day and he goes, Chris, um, you're a little bit too hard on people. And so I went home and cried for three days. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, I'm a bad person. I'm supposed to be teaching this to people. And uh, I can't do it myself. So I called up Sydney Banks, and I'm crying and crying. He says, he said to me, he said, I told him what the problem was. And, and he said, now, this is the thing. Sometimes we get in a low mood, and sometimes we get in a very low mood, like you are right now. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can see something about yourself that you'd like to change, 
just change it and forget it. Yeah. Because then, then I think you should move to Hawaii and set up a clinic there. It's like, oh, great idea. Wow. And so it was his suggestion? Yeah, it was his suggestion. Wow, amazing. And so, yeah. So I, I just said, yeah, that's good. And I, I just had no fear of it. I just mm-hmm. knew that was the thing to do. So I talked three of my girlfriends into moving with me. <laughs> and um, we, we moved over to Oahu. And getting here, we realized that it was uh, masquerading as a state. It was really another country <laughs> with its own culture and its own language, really, that mm-hmm. everything was really uh, different. So we had to kind of settle in for about a year and, and uh, really learn how to live in a different feeling again. Yeah. Wow. And so we, and we set up a clinic, and pretty soon it uh, start, I started getting some grants. And people used to, when we first moved to Hawaii, uh, people in the mental health profession used to call us the Sunshine Girls. <laughs> because they were so happy and yeah. they had they'd never seen people in the mental health field that were that happy and it was funny because my my boyfriend at the time I actually met my husband like two months after I got there mm-hmm. and I was dating him and he was uh, surfing one day and another surfer was out there who was in charge of another employee assistance program so they knew each other and he said to me he says you know have you met these girls that are over in uh, yeah, Kailua they're like so positive. Are they on drugs or what? <laughs> and, and my husband didn't tell him that he, he knew me. He goes, oh, yeah, I know. But they're, no, they're not on drugs. They're, they're, they're just pretty happy people. Wow. Goes, OK, interesting. So long story short, then we eventually uh, grew to, at one point, I had um, about 65 employees. Wow. Several big contracts. But the state then started to decide that they were going to tell us how to treat people, oh. even though we had better results than anybody else. Wow. And, um, so we moved out of that and downsized again. Mm. But yeah, so now we have offices on Oahu and on the Big Island. Wonderful. Now, are most of your clients, I mean, I know you do a lot with, um, you're, a, a, as I said, a licensed um, addictions or, um, is it, it, make sure I'm getting, um, well, both exactly what would you say um are the majority of your clients what what do they come in with what do they um you mean for the clinic or for me well for you as as a three principles now are you are you strictly a three principles practitioner or, or you still do the well you don't do the regular therapy anymore so so yeah when they come and see you what do they use are they usually um dealing with addictions or, or what has got them in into seeing you? Uh, I would say that most people start off by coming with some kind of an issue with another human being. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, you know, so it's like marriage, relationship, family, parenting. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where most people start off from. Sometimes they also have addiction problems as a result mm-hmm. of the level that they're living at. But I also work with a, um, a uh, boarding school. And uh, so I see a lot of high, really high functioning um, young teenagers that are pretty stressed out yeah. and um, having, you know, lots of pressure that they, they put on themselves really. Yeah. But, so I, I do that. And so I work with kids, I work with adults, I work with couples, I work with um, families. And uh, we also work with vets. We, we have got a big um, caseload of um, veterans from mm-hmm. the VA with PTSD. Mm. And, um, and and substance abusers that come in, anger management um, mm. kinds of issues that come in. I know that's the, that's the beauty of the principles. It's 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 just across the board. Yeah. So how do you when you first get a client coming in that just has no sort of concept of the inside out nature of life and and is pretty sort of solidly stuck in their story? How would you first you know, start to present what what we see to somebody like that? Um, well, what I do is I, I just get to know the person, first of all. But mm-hmm. in, in the way that I get to know them, uh, I think it's just the whole, when you understand the principles, the way you interact with people is different. Yeah. So in, like in the in the past, I, if people would tell me about some awful thing that happened, I would be like, oh my God, that's so terrible, that's awful. And and I just don't do that now. Like I'll listen and I'm 
empathetic with people, but that's like their problem is not the big deal to me. So what I'm listening for is I'm listening for how their help has come through them. And I usually start in that way just to let them see how their innate state of mental well-being has always been there and mm -hmm. will always be there and how they can like recognize the importance that mental well-being has to overcome whatever issues they've come in with. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, that's, I mean, that's really exactly what it is. That's very succinct, but it is, you know, I find the same with my clients. I mean, there, it's, it's, um, it's hard sometimes when, um, well, it's not hard. <laughs> that's a thought. We're not going to go down there. But, um, but it is, it's been there with empathy without getting um, caught up in the story or the, or the weeds of, of, of what somebody's talking about. So um, I know that you, you co-wrote a book with Laurie, um, I'm going to say her name wrong, um, Carpenter? Carpenos. Carpenos, that's right, all about love. So um, can you tell me a bit more about that book? Oh, sure. Uh, to me, that this book is really about the living of the principles. Mm -hmm. And um, because we're both marriage and family therapists, we, we kind of were talking and we thought that people are for love. Like I was looking for love when I went to the, to the conference. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. And so it's usually the mystery of, for people is how to stay in that feeling of they can fall in love easily, mm -hmm. but staying in that feeling of love and then understanding how that is what brings the magic into your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, there's, it's a book of stories. And what we did was we listened to a tape that Sydney Banks did called Thought and Marriage. Mm -hmm. And it's about relationships, right? And so we were so um, inspired by that that we thought we would take um, – excerpts from that tape and other things that other quotes that he had and then have a story that kind of ex is an example of how that understanding would affect various situations and then just a short discussion afterwards right. and partly that's because we think that stories are the best way to really help people to see the principles yeah and um and we wanted to keep it really as clean as possible with us, us talking about the principles. So we're really talking about living from an understanding of the principles. Mm. So it's actually, I think it's a, it's a good book for anybody. Yeah. Um, it, Cause it's not, some people think it's just about, you know, couples or relationships, which a lot of the stories are, mm -hmm. but I always tell my clients, just read it for the idea about how to live from the principles, because you might not have that specific story, but, have something that's yeah. like it that's so funny that i think when i first came across the principles i immediately was reminded of myself when i was a teenager and i remember thinking one day oh my god i can actually talk myself into loving somebody and right back out of it i mean i was so aware of my thinking wow that's great i know and it was like so when i came across it again i was like oh I know this, you know, I, I mean, I, yeah. we always say we know it because it's, it's who we are, it's what we're made of. But yeah. to have that awareness, you know, as a teenager, I thought was pretty, oh, pretty yeah. what amazing. A, what a great insight. Yeah. So basically, so once you found that love within yourself and um, moved to Hawaii, you did have, find love and marriage and. I did, so, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I've been married, uh, this year will be. Uh, 29 years. Wow, it's amazing. I was sharing with Elsie the other day that that is something so beautiful about most of the um, the um, first generation teachers. I just see that they have these incredibly fresh, beautiful, alive um, relationships. Mm -hmm. So um, would you attribute, I mean, I, I think the principles is definitely what keeps that. I, I know the understanding of separate realities has helped me immensely in my relationships, <laughs> not to expect my partner to see the world as I do. Yeah. So. Well, it, I'll, I'll tell you, um, we've gone through a lot. My husband's middle son um, got really gravely ill and died when he was 25. Oh, yeah. 
we've um, been back and forth to the mainland a couple times and uh, not not having the principles would not have we would not have made it I'm sure yeah because mm -hmm. uh, it's it without understanding that what I feel comes from me mm -hmm. you know it's like that's such a powerful thing for me in my relationship and so what he, what comes from him is his deal it's not mine mm -hmm. and um, understanding that and knowing to always go back to the feeling like that's um, one of the things that we do is we just do things by feel and we both are on the same page with that you know so we both get on into a good feeling about whatever it is we want to do and then we do it mm -hmm. that's been such a gift and honestly i mean i couldn't have met a better man than i it took me a long time to meet him but mm -hmm. when i met him he was exactly perfect and so i told him when we got married i said you know honey that if we're getting married we'll never get divorced and he said oh well, why is that? I said, because it'd be really bad for business. And <laughs> so I just absolutely can't, wouldn't tolerate that. So you're, you just have to be sure you want to marry me because this is, the, we're not having a divorce. <laughs> so he said, oh, okay, that's great. And, you know, honestly, that's one of the things that I think people do is they entertain the idea of divorce. Yeah. And, and so it makes it something that's plausible or something mm -hmm. that's um, a possibility. Whereas, if you know that the only thing that's wrong in any relationship is negative thought, mm -hmm. it's silly to go through all that drama and pain and suffering. Yeah, I know exactly. That's well. That's wonderful that you that you knew it before you got married, yeah. and you didn't have to go through that. You know, yeah. having yeah. Had I gotten married before I learned the principles, I would never have stayed married to anybody. Yeah. And um, yes, yeah, it. it um, it was a blessing in, in that way. But yeah, I met him and then um, uh, he was single at the time. He had been, he'd been divorced and his mm -hmm. children were with his ex-wife. And then about six months later, I got all three kids. So I, <laughs> I uh, went family. from not having any, not ever leave, living with a man, but being married and having three sons that were all teenagers. So oh wow, <laughs> it was a, uh, I, I often said that I didn't ever write this book, but I was going to write a book called um, uh, How to Be Hated and Still Keep Your Self-Esteem, The Guide to Step Parenting. <laughs> that, that's a great book. I, I'm sure that's yeah, actually. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it, it, it's going to come. Yeah. But I had to wait till they're old enough that I could write it. <laughs> That's so funny. So um, if you were going to sort of leave our listeners with just anything to really, which on, on the subject of relationships and um, anybody that is contemplating or, I mean, I notice for myself, I mean, depending on my mood, I could be sort of not certainly not anymore, but but in the beginning of my relationship I have now, there were days where I'd be, I'd be going, oh, I don't know if we're so compatible. And now, thank goodness, I'm just like, if, if even that thought comes through my head for a second I'm just like I know it's going to pass it's just a momentary thought and I'm not going to pay any attention to it so that's helped me so what would you say what would you just it's not advice but just words of wisdom that you would share with anybody that may be struggling with an addiction or a relationship they think is is failing and um they were coming to see you what would you what's some of the things you would leave them with well I think that negative thought is the culprit in most people's suffering mm -hmm. and um it's easy to get caught up in our thinking and not know it because yeah. it really looks like it's the other person it looks like it's the problems in our life it looks like it's what's out there that's making us feel bad in here. and so when we're caught in the illusion that thought creates that the outside world is what creates our experience then we try to fix the outside world so that we feel better. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't work. And so instead of saying like, oh, this doesn't work, we like don't turn around and say, let's do it the other way. Maybe I need to change where I'm at and then how I see the outside world will change. Yeah. And that's kind of the magic of it, like living in love and coming from love. So like for me, I try to not interact i mean I, I don't do this all the time i, I do my best but I, mm -hmm. I i get caught up in my thinking too but coming from love 
is the most powerful thing that I've ever done. Like to see that that's something I could consciously do. Like don't say this until you can come from a place of love with this person. Yeah. yeah. And then, so to me, whether that's like dealing with an addiction is the same thing. It's like you're just looking for love and in doing something to yourself. You're looking for a good feeling by doing something to make you feel better mm-hmm. without realizing that that's built into you. Yeah. That everything you need and want is already inside you. That's so beautiful. That's, I mean, and it's so true. It's so true. I found myself, big confession here, I found myself like sort of being a bit nitpicky a couple of weeks ago. and. And I mean, my my boyfriend knows the principles. We've been together for nine and a half years now. But he, um, in that moment, he was he's such a sweet, sweet man. And he went, he went, you know, I'm going to try really hard not to do that. And I'm like, no, don't don't bother. It's okay. It's just I need to change my thinking. <laughs> you don't need to do anything. Yeah. But it was so funny. I just caught myself in that moment, going, oh my god. But we do. We forget, and um, it's just natural. But it's the it's the resilience. It's the it's the being able to go. Oh, I recognize what I'm doing right now. I'm just having some negative thinking, and I'm not, as you say, not coming from love. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, my husband is Hawaiian, and uh, he grew up in a culture that did not does not uh, value a busy mind. Mm, wow. So my Achilles heel is I get going too fast in my head, doing too many things, and and he, my husband will bristle a little bit. Like if I'm going too fast, he'll be like, <laughs> and I know now that when he does that, I'm going too fast. So he's yes. like my mirror mm. he helps me to see and and that's why one, one of the things that makes it perfect for him is for us is that you know mm. he's um he, he he naturally grew up in a world understanding about aloha which is yeah. that living in a beautiful state of mind living in mental well-being wow so, uh, he, he's he's been i always say that he keeps me honest yeah he, he's, uh, i don't I, I don't get to uh, indulge in negativity on the side. <laughs> that's perfect. That's perfect. That that's where you found yourself too, in in that culture, as you say, mm-hmm. where that's that's valued. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. This has been amazing and oh, um, goes very fast, half an hour. But thank you, and um, I hope to see you soon. Oh, thank you so much, John. I really, I really uh, appreciate, appreciate all that, all that you're, you're doing, doing to help. help spread the principles in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you too. Okay, bye-bye.